Good morning. Everyone here in the back? When the speakers begin, please let us also know that you can't hear their own different microphones. My name is uh, Stuart Sobotsky. Not really, but I'm, I'm going to use it t two different ways. Uh, okay. uh, and I'm the uh, co-president of the American Association of Transpersonal Psychology. And I'm the moderator this morning for our group on transpersonal psychotherapies. Before I introduce our four presenters, I thought I would try to convey at least one way of attuning to the goal of all these different methods of psychotherapy. The better the method, the better everything will work. And if you can get the method to work, that's what the designer of the method, or the microphone, I guess, uh, had in mind. Uh, so I'm brought an instrument that is uh, in, in the tradition from which it comes. Play, it, it's made to play the sound of the earth. It's roughly C sharp. And uh, in listening, I'm, I'm trying to give you at least a short experience of three or four minutes of maybe uh, at least some uh, general sense of what a goal of psychotherapy might be at least from a transpersonal perspective, an all-purpose state of, uh, of inner calm uh, that would resolve a lot, of, that would mean that a lot of issues have been resolved. First speaker will be Vladimir Maikov, who is the Ubiquities Vice President for Russia and the CIS Chair of Transpersonal Psychology at the Moscow Institute of Psychoanalysis. He's a founding member and president of the Russian Association for Transpersonal Psychology and Psychotherapy and founder of an international publishing project to publish transpersonal psychology texts in Russia. He is a certified psychotherapist that holds a master's degree in biophysics and a PhD in philosophy of consciousness. And I've known him for nine years. And he, he makes no mistakes. Not, not one. <laughs> is that right? Yes. Yeah. You, 
agrees with me. He will have 10 minutes, which also makes it easy not to make as many mistakes. 10 minutes and we control everyone's time very carefully. Uh, his topic will be new international perspectives in breath work. Oh no, no. Oh. <laughs> it's not. I make mistakes. <laughs> I, I make them. Vladimir does not make them. Please. Right now. No, no, not right now. Just the title. Okay. Your title is Primordial right. Psychologies, Psychology. which I think Psychology. I'm I'm personally very impressed. <laughs> Jana Marovic, Dr. Jana Marovic is a clinical psychologist and transpersonal therapist who holds a PhD in medical psychology. She is in private practice at the ADD Nova Clinic in Johannesburg, South Africa. Jana has published in international academic journals and a book on supervision. She is an executive member of the International Transpersonal Association, an accredited trainer for transpersonal workshops in South Africa, and she guides holistic wellness retreats in the mountains near Johannesburg and is a yoga teacher, and also is a friend of mine. She's amazing. I just, always, when I hear her speak, I just feel uplifted. And I hope I have your talk correct. Uh, quantum consciousness, yes? <laughs> tell, tell everyone. Um, uh, it is called Mysteries of the Universe and Psychotherapy. <laughs> Dmitris Slivas. Graduated from Athens Medical School in 1980, specialized in psycho, uh, psychiatry along with a five-year training in psychotherapy and group analysis. From 1997 to 2005, he was a trainer and supervisor in psychotherapy, and since 1994, he works in his private practice. From 1998 to 2010, he was on the board of the National Organization of Psychotherapy of Greece and president and treasurer, trying to upgrade and harmonize training criteria for psychotherapy throughout the country, according to Euro European EAP directives. Since 1989, he is a member of the Antistigma, a network for the transgressions and rights in the mental health field. From his adolescence onward, starting from Orthodox Greek Christianity, he has studied a, vi a variety of religions and esoteric practices, Tai Chi, astrology, Reiki. He is being trained in regression therapy by the illustrious Victor Rodriguez. Is he here? Yes. You're always someone. Some. <laughs> and has, been, uh, has just received his diploma in homeopathy. Wow. You know, each of these takes a long time to uh, master. He is a founding member of Synthesis and its treasurer since 2013. His topic, and I know this because he told me personally, is <laughs> professional and personal accounts of the transpersonal. Unless it's been changed. <laughs> <laughs> Judith Miller, PhD, is a professor of developmental psychology at Columbia University, great American university, and a holotropic breathwork trainer and facilitator in the U.S. and in Germany. She supervises psychotherapists interested in psycho-spiritual processes in the US, Europe, and Asia. She is a teacher of psycho-spiritual development and the author of Direct Connection. Judith, what is your title? A Broken Watch. Wow, very enigmatic. Okay. You have to listen. A Broken Watch. A Broken Watch. A Broken Watch. 
Our panelists will have about 10 minutes each, and then they'll see signs telling them as they as you get close to five minutes left, and then I will chop the axe. <laughs> Will you introduce some topics about therapy? Focalizer. He says, okay, try this. I would say that um, I've been a, a transpersonal therapist for about 42 years. And what, uh, what is uh, important in my uh, retrospect upon my career is trying to re remember what is the goal of the therapy. Um, often, I, as I listen to uh, trainers, I've been on the board of uh, the California Institute of Integral Studies for about 20 years on the Academic Affairs Committee, and, and I would listen and think, oh, it sounds like the goal is the implementation of your theory. And the client, uh, the, the goal is for them to get the theory that, you're, that the therapist is using and to become somewhat skillful at the language, of uh, the Jungian language or a psychoanalytic language or whatever the language might be, and as the client, uh, as the therapist is successful in uh, having the client you use the language to s describe his or her experience or identify patterns from the past uh, and be very skillful at that, we walk away thinking that that may have been the goal that, of, of the therapy. And what always had struck me was uh, when I would look back at what I settled for in, over my years of, of a therapist and uh, was breaking up uh, as the process unfolded. Uh, is family that malleable and arbitrary uh, and uh, functioning? You know uh, that's why I think in America coaching became very popular because psychotherapies had a tendency to teach the theory to the client and coaches. Uh, their main theory was getting you to achieve the goals that you set out for yourself. So I hope that as our panelists uh, address their uh, topics and their ways of looking at uh, transpersonal therapy, that they'll take a moment and uh, refresh us with their uh, vision of what's it all for? What is it, what's supposed to be happening? Is it, is, uh, uh, Freud said, love and work. Said the outcomes of a good therapy would be that you can love people, and you can hold a job. <laughs> and in a way, it packs a lot of significance. If, if, if love is no simple thing. It, it involves lots of other skills, you could say. Forgiving people instead of just ending it, all kinds of things. Uh, and work, we have to have value. We have to somehow uh, manifest skills that have a financial value that is also, it sounds pretty materialistic, but it, probably has a lot of spirituality packed into it to be part of the human community and be seen as worthy, whether you're washing a dish. I have uh, clients uh, that, uh, with Down syndrome, and when they wash a dish, they smile like uh, nobody's business. So it doesn't matter. Uh, it's the, the, the giving of a service to our uh, human family. So I hope that the panel will pay uh, if you have a little space for it, or you already are going to address, what, what is it all for as you describe uh, the, the theories that you have? My uh, presentation is primordial psychotherapy. And uh, for me, primordial, the, the very idea of primordial therapy uh, comes from the question, what was therapy, psychotherapy, before psychotherapy? Before this giant Freud and Breuer who invented modern deep psychology and psychotherapy. How, for thousands and thousands of years, humanity solved problems, tensions, released them. What methods uh, they taught, uh, used, transmitted, and uh, to heal, to continue uh, uh, healthy living. And so uh, uh, this uh, brought me to the giant field of unresolved questions, since uh, psychotherapy uh, is uh, very much 
uh, developing in our time. Uh, in each country, we have national association struggle between different psychotherapeutic schools. Each year, we have new schools with copyright uh, trademarks. This is my school, don't teach my school, don't use my, my methods. Have all that stuff, and uh, uh, we obsessed, uh, and uh, we, uh, we are, it's enough for us. But at the same time, uh, looking for the skills of the great psychotherapist I was lucky uh, to, uh, to meet, uh, I uh, started to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to learn that there is something primordial, that uh, there is something in the very essence which really works. And uh, uh, one of the uh, sources of uh, the idea of primordial psychotherapy was uh, Carl Gustav Jung's ideas about origin of uh, psychotherapy from the ancient practice of the care of the soul. Care of the soul. Uh, which uh, was um, actually uh, in the framework in, of different religious traditions, ascetic tradition. And there is a brilliant uh, research by uh, Michel Foucault, I strongly recommend, uh, several of his uh, late books especially about this issue, uh, where he explores how the very um, space of the care of the soul was formed in a European uh, culture. But if we don't limit ourselves by European perspective, and uh, we will look uh, in more wider perspective, in, in, in trying to include uh, everything, Eastern perspective, we will find that uh, the um, idea of therapy before therapy, primordial therapy, has uh, several other important uh, sources. And uh, to tell the story short, since uh, actually I am uh, publishing a book uh, at the beginning next year on this issue, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, quite uh, many, many, many aspects and layers, but to tell the story short, I just want to remind you uh, the history of um, Western medicine, uh, the history uh, of Asclepius and Hippocrates. Uh, it's uh, uh, well known that the father of Greek medicine was a uh, Centaurus Hieron. Here is a picture. Who was uh, a teacher of the uh, Greek gods, and one of the skills he taught was medicine. And uh, uh, Asclepius, the uh, Greek god of medicine, or Esculapus in uh, Roman tradition, uh, was uh, the student of um, uh, 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 Hieron. And uh, this is uh, Peloponnes, uh, Epidabr, Asclepius uh, healing theater for thousands of patients. And in such kind of theaters, or uh, temples of Asclepius, ancient Greeks uh, got healed, uh, mainly through dreams. And it was uh, through voices of the gods, uh, through messages. And if you visit, uh, there is a, a nice um, uh, island, Kos Island, there is also a great Asclepius uh, place uh, on the Kos Island. And also uh, there is a um, place with um, Hippocrat um, tree at the same island. And so uh, uh, the uh, 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 Asian Greek medicine was mainly inner medicine. We got healed through inner connection with uh, divine and infinite realms, with gods. And here are uh, pictures of uh, two daughters uh, of Asclepius, also goddess, Panacea, Panacea and Hygiena. We know what does it mean in modern world. And in the middle, uh, 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 it's Hippocrat and his uh, uh, text of Hippocrat. Every uh, physician uh, uh, repeat uh, to be a doctor, med medical doctor. And Hippocrat, uh, converted the whole picture of uh, primordial Greek medicine, looking for the source of uh, uh, the different diseases in the body, in outer, not in the psyche, not in the uh, uh, um, disturbing inner connection with God, but uh, in some material uh, stuff. And uh, throughout the centuries, uh, this uh, uh, complicated balance between out and inner medicine was repeated again and again and again and again in the history of uh, Western medicine. If you look into Tibetan medicine, we will find a similar picture. 
For example, the great uh, Tibetan Saint Padma Samhava, in his medical scriptures, advise to look for, first of all, negative emotions as the primal source of psychosomatical disease, uh, which uh, uh, produce uh, fatal uh, physical uh, diseases. And so, uh, mm, uh, 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 when I started to look for um, uh, skills of great psychotherapist, uh, uh, I've met several great uh, people like Anna Sinkin, who was close student of uh, Fritz Perls, the founder of uh, Gestalt, and I've seen uh, her brilliant work at the conference Psyche and Soul in Finkhorn Foundation in 1989. And uh, during the lunch, uh, of course, since I was very much interested, I asked her, uh, what is, uh, who is the great uh, therapist? What is the essence of psychotherapy? And he replied, smiling. Miraculously, psychotherapist is old Jewish grandmother. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, I didn't, didn't understand her at this particular moment, since I was so strong, young, wanting to know, and she just replied some miracles, fairy tales. But lately, I uh, uh, realized that she was this uh, great, uh, good uh, Jewish mother, accepting everything, supporting everything, not in the future, not in the past, doing therapy with some uh, elusive stuff, but right now, unconditionally. And this was uh, her uh, direct message, everything is good, right now. And uh, for me, everything is good became uh, uh, one of the forms of so-called primordial psychotherapy, unconditional good. And lately, uh, in the Tibetan tradition, I found it that uh, the uh, primordial Adi Buddha, uh, the symbol of cosmic Buddha in Tibetan is translated as Kuntu Zampo, which in Tibetan language means everything is good. So everything is good is the supreme method for psychotherapy, for spiritual teaching, for transmitting uh, uh, primordial state. And in this perspective, um, not only professional um, uh, psychotherapists can be great psychotherapists, as you know. For example, for me, to be honest, one of my favorite uh, uh, psychotherapists is Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. Yeah, he transmits this state, and uh, um, when... Uh, uh, I, I feel something, uh, I can just uh, uh, put video with him or uh, he, uh, the disc or uh, sometimes uh, when he visits Moscow with all my family and friends, uh, I go to uh, his performances. So art of being a connection with goodness, this is primordial and if psychotherapist is connected, if he has his exp or her experience of goodness, it will, trans uh, uh, it will uh, um, uh, transcend any boundaries between uh, him and client and uh, will support any, pro any process, despite the particular circumstances and methods. Another example I want to share about primordial uh, therapy is my meeting with uh, the I met in Buryati in 1982. Uh, it was second visit of his holiness uh, in uh, uh, Soviet Union. And uh, it was very interesting picture that in Buryatia we had uh, something like uh, 10,000 people collected for the teaching. 5,000 uh, uh, Buryat uh, grandmothers, uh, old people, men and women. And 5,000, uh, it's uh, uh, KGB and police, something like that. And so, and small amount of uh, not Buryat uh, li like me, uh, European uh, liking people. And uh, His Holiness started to give a teaching for the next three days. Uh, Green Tara, Avalakiteshvara and Manjushri. Uh, three very important teachings. First was um, uh, um, Manjushri and he is... Uh, no, first was um, Avalakiteshvara, uh, Bodhisattva of, of compassion and he is considered to be embodiment of uh, this compassion. And uh, he started uh, teaching, everything was brilliant, but there was a little problem. He taught on Tibetan, and since the most uh, people were Buryatian, uh, it was translated from uh, Tibetan into Buryatian. And no, neither me nor other people did know uh, Tibetan or Buryatian. But it happens 
that uh, despite the fact that I wasn't connected uh, to a particular language, after uh, finishing teaching, I've seen a, a line of people, 10,000 people, uh, going uh, uh, aside Dalai Lama, and he uh, empowered uh, all of them. KGB agent, police, uh, Buryat old man and woman. And at some particular moment, I felt that I'm not staying, but I'm lying, crying, and uh, embracing the earth. And uh, for me, it was great therapy. Since I was a student of uh, philosophy, a postgraduate study, I was too much in uh, head at this time. I uh, had a recover, uh, a recurrent dreams about cutting my head. It was awful for me. But this night, I healed. Uh, it was a kind of uh, going beyond time. Polizia. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, I just summarize. Uh, 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 nine types of primordial therapy, you can see it, uh, as uh, time-space travel, as communication, as uh, awakening, etc., uh, etc., et as uh, heroism, it's uh, uh, described in details in my forthcoming book. Thank you for your attention. My presentation is a personal account, mostly, and uh, it's called, because I'm not sure what Stuart said before, it's called uh, a personal account through and towards the transpersonal. So I'm not a very exhibitionistic person, I would not like to be taken as one, okay, it would be very unjust for me. Uh, I was born in the 60s, in a middle-class family that mostly had a descent from refugees from Asia Minor and Bulgaria. And uh, that's why some of my friends say that that is the reason why I always am seeking for the, the center that, can, that is not moving, which can be inside, I don't know. So for many years, as a small child, I was the first born, I was uh, torn between uh, my grandmother and uh, my frustrated mother, who was a very dynamic woman. My grandmother was the mother of my father, who was a very sweet but avoidant person. So I was, uh, I, I, I don't think it's the cause, but I think it's a synchronicity that uh, I was a very shy and introverted uh, small child, even, even in this period. But of course, I had a kind of uh, refuge uh, through, through reading. I read a lot. I was a bookworm. Of course, a fatty uh, small child with Bynes eating crisis. And uh, when I reached adolescence, I felt a great inclination towards Eastern Orthodox mysticism because I was raised as a Greek Orthodox. I had begun reading Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, and uh, I felt very much, you know, towards them. Uh, during Easter, I cried a lot. I felt like I was following the steps of Christ through the towards the crucifixion. And of course, a very romantic person that was very afraid of women. Uh, there was also a great idealization of medicine. My father was a doctor, he was a medical doctor. He was um, an army doctor, an oculist. But I wanted to be a psychiatrist through Dostoevsky. And of course there was a disidealization. I read a lot about the life of Albert Schweitzer. I read a lot of uh, Cronin's books. I don't know if you are acquainted with the keys of the kingdom and uh, all that thing. And then I entered medicine and I began uh, experimenting. I began experimenting with cannabis, not so well. I began experimenting with astrology. I had three years of astrological lessons because I really wanted to know about how much free will is there. I hope there was. I found there is, but okay, we can discuss about it. <laughs> yes, it's a very, you can, we can talk for, for days. So it was 1974 and uh, there was the fall of the Hunda, 
the, uh, the army junta in Greece. And there was an outburst of uh, spiritual things in Greece because uh, all these things were considered cults to them. We were listening to rock music and, uh, you know, it was like uh, Woodstock happened 10 years later for us. And uh, there were a lot of spiritual teachers or teachings of every tradition. There were books that were sold in, uh, you know, out in the sidewalks. I mean, even, uh, you know, rubbish books like uh, The Opening of the Third Eye, something like that. <laughs> And um, I had Tai Chi then, and, and, and there I, I really had the experience of what we call the energy body. I mean, uh, during a session of Tai Chi, I really felt like my energy body expanded like three times over or five times. And then I knew as an experience that, it, that it, there is an energy body, we're not just our physical body. And then, uh, through some friends, I joined the so-called Rosicrucian Order at that time, which had to do with Western tradition, Kabbalistic, inner Christianity. I was very pleased. I had so many people around me that were thinking maybe the same way as I. We can fall in love with girls that, you know, have the same mind, let say. And I discovered some extrasensory possibilities because we were, had some training in exercises like that and I, I knew that uh, we had uh, psychometry, telepathy, astral projection. Now I don't have anything about this. I have lost all of them and it's good that I have lost them. But at that time it was very, you know, it was uh, exalting. And of course there were many problematic brothers and sisters like me brothers and sisters in inverted commas, people that uh, trying to escape life through all these spiritual things, and they had problems with their families, they had uh, problems with their uh, wives and husbands. So I was sensitized to this as a future psychiatrist, let's say. But of course I knew from the, the scriptures that from their fruits you will know them, and that's a thing that follows me till now. I don't believe in MDs or PhDs, I just look at the person. And of course there were people that, uh, you know, they, they took me along with uh, some pop to see around some popular masters of this period. There was some, uh, there was a person that he was a technician, a dental technician, that believed that he was the new John the Baptist. And he had an audience of academically trained people. I was so much surprised. So the teacher invoked the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit entered someone from the audience and he began or she began to talk in a strange language. And the teacher, of course, uh, did the uh, interpretation, the translation for us. So I think that was a training for me in apathy because I had to stay calm and not, you know, burst out in laughter in front of so many people. <laughs> And then there was this girl of the order that uh, she was hospitalized for three days in a mental hospital because she didn't abuse of fasting and meditating. That was a great uh, lesson also. I mean, uh, we're pretending to follow oriental techniques in the West and we don't have oriental gurus around. We don't have oriental culture around to, you know, to, have, to keep us. And we are uh, walking uh, in, uh, in cities that don't have to do anything with uh, Bengal or Calcutta or, um, let's say, I don't know, maybe Konya. Uh, and then our master in the order was accused of, uh, you know, um, doing uh, passes to people. He used his knowledge to seduce young boys. Um, he said that uh, men are fire and the women are water, so why go with women? Because they're going to, you know, to put your fire out. <laughs> and then he was accused also of uh, taking some money for himself. So I, along with some other people, to made a report to the order and we left with very much bitterness and pain and disillusionment, of course. And then I had to end to have my, my army service and that was, you know, a great relief for me because a kind of breaking up with the old patterns 
and entering a kind of, uh, it, it was kind of a rite of passage for me. It was like entering another space. Uh, of course, it was a space of, uh, you know, disillusionment, but I think a positive disillusionment. And I was confronted with all my fear of aggression, because it was a masculine and very vulgar uh, space, the army. But in the long run, I think it was a lot of good experience. And then leaving the army, I had to face uh, my specialization in psychiatry. I had to have a training in psychotherapy, because I always wanted to be a psychotherapist. Well, behavior was not for me. It was too technical, too mechanistic. Psychoanalysis, in my eyes at least, looked a bit of a religion, and a very rigid religion, you know, at that time. Uh, always interpreting art, religion, even, you know, not leaving nothing to bow. And I thought it was a kind of, uh, you know, 19th century epistemology. I had read Taoist physics and I wanted to, you know, to have a more, let's say, spherical uh, approach. So I found group psychotherapy. And I think group psychotherapy is much better for narcissistic therapists because they have to be exposed <laughs> and they cannot be all knowing for long. <laughs> and of course, I have my narcissistic fears, but I, it was a, a great challenge. Um, I'm not thinking that I'm going to finish that, but I'm going to do my best. And uh, I think the real person comes out only through the, uh, you know, contact with other persons. It's a kind of, it's the horizontal, uh, let's say, branch of the cross. The vertical is the, our contact with God and the horizontal is our contact with other people. And the group gave me this. But of course, there was a lot of other problems that stayed there. And uh, the great turning point, I think, in my life and in my transpersonal formation was uh, that I felt I was you know, fed up of the agony of, uh, and the fear of personal relationships were great. So there was a need to confess for the first time in my life. I mean, consciously confess. So I went to a confessor, a monk, who was very well known as a confessor, and rightly, I think. It was a very small confession. I told him I feel out of, out of my center. I feel away from God. That's, why, that's what I felt at that time. And he just read the prayer. And I left relieved. But the next three or five, I, I don't remember, three or five days, those were kind of very transformative experience. I felt my body like three meters high. I felt like I was walking one meter higher than the sidewalk. I felt like, uh, you know, weeping all the time. I wanted to forgive everybody that had hurt me, and I wanted to be forgiven by everybody that I had hurt. And for the first time in my life, I wanted to make presents to everyone I loved. You know, I was a very ungiving person. And that was a very, you know, it's a very good uh, trait for a, a future treasurer, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, to be short, my contact with uh, Lindy made me, you know, to come into the transpersonal formation as a psychotherapeutic approach. And I think I'm, all the time I'm trying to find that uh, the spiritual approach, the transpersonal approach, um, can really, you know, uh, be added and transform all the other formations one can have. I mean, uh, my psychiatric formation, my psych group psychotherapeutic formation, and uh, this conference has given me a lot of work to think about, even if I've, I have not been in one lecture till now. But there is a kind of energy here and there's a lot of hope for me and for you, I hope. Thank you. Good morning. Um, so, like Dimitri, uh, this conference also gives me a lot, and um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm aware and I'm open each minute what, what I'm getting and, and what's resonating with me. So, um, the Stuart, when, when he introduced, uh, there was a question that he asked that stayed with me, and that was, what is it all for? So that resonated with me. And what Vladimir said that was particularly significant to me was, what was psychotherapy before psychotherapy? And then Dimitri just now, what I resonated to was when he was talking about fire and water. So where did this take me for my 10 minutes to say to you? Um, let, let me start by saying that I heard this morning, I, I didn't happen to look at the internet on my iPhone, but I did hear something about Turkey and Syria going into some kind of war. So don't, you know, I don't know the facts, but this, this to me was just another um, example of where I'm at now, because I, I said it last night in the, the circle of elders. To me, it feels like the world is on fire. And it feels to me like we're in, in really deep trouble at every area. And you will know that. There's nothing new that I'm saying. And um, so this is with me all the time. And of course, this has been prophesized for thousands of years in all kinds of different cultures that now is the time. And we're in it. We're in it. So the question that comes up for me now um, in my life, and, um, and I, I believe since I do identify as being a transpersonal psychologist, the, the question for me now is, what is psychotherapy after psychotherapy? And since I am living in 2014, and since the world seems to be exploding in 2014, it's, it's hard for me to think of psychotherapy in a different context than the environment that I'm living in. And then, then I think of the word transpersonal itself. What, what, we know what transpersonal means. I mean, 40 years ago, it, that word came into being uh, by the early pioneers, transpersonal meaning beyond the personal, beyond the personal. So, psychotherapy after psychotherapy has to be beyond the personal, I believe. So, what is beyond the personal? And, and we, know, we know the words. We, we can say consciousness, evolution. We can say the sacred. We can say the ground beyond time and space, and we, we use these terms all the time. But how seriously do we take it? You know, we're, we're transpersonal. Why do we think of psychotherapy in personal ways? Because psychotherapy all these years since Freud, that has focused on the personal, where has that led us? It's led us to where we are today. It's, it's led us to darkness and light and fire and water. So all I can do is give you an example now of, for me, 
what psychotherapy after psychotherapy means. And I mentioned the broken watch, and it's just my little personal example for me of what's happened in this conference to me. Here's my watch, and it's broken. And um, it all began the, the first day of the conference. I was sitting with my colleague and friend Ingo Jartsitz, and we were talking to a woman, Netta, from Israel. I don't know if Netta's here. Uh, there you are. So I'm sorry I'm getting you involved, but um, just to sum up the very quick story, because I only have a few minutes left, Ingo and I were supposed to lead a breathwork retreat in Israel this summer. And it, it was to evolve out of the 15 years that Ingo and I have been working in Germany and doing breathwork retreats around issues regarding the German-Jewish thing. Um, and I'm Jewish and he's German and people would come and they would do breath work and invariably the collective would come up and okay. So this was sort of going to be a coming together of all this work that we had been doing all these years in Israel. And Netta, it, Ingo and, and Christiana, his wife, they went to Israel in the middle of the winter and they met Netta and they met other Israelis, and there was going to be all this help in getting people together. So Germans were going to come, and Americans were going to come, and Israelis were going to be there. Maybe a few Arabs would sneak in, and we were going to have this really cool thing, you know, that, that was probably going to save the world, right? Well, to make the long story short, of down. So we had no contact with her for a long time. It was getting close to us going to Israel, and lots of Germans were coming, and a few Americans and Europeans were coming, but no Israelis had signed up. And Ingo decided to go to Siberia during this time, and it was left to me to make contact with Netta and other people about getting Israelis. And I would write lots of emails and make lots of calls, and no one would get back to me. And I guess I really didn't want to go anyway. It was kind of Ingo's idea, but I was going ahead. There was something in me that felt it's not time and we shouldn't be doing this. And anyway, I have ambivalence. Um, so then Ingo came back from Siberia and said, and I said, it's not working. We've got to cancel the whole thing. And he said, no, all these Germans want to go. The Europeans want to go. If you don't want to go, you don't have to. I'm going. And I said, OK, I'll go with you. Mumble, mumble, OK. <laughs> and then the war happened, right? And then the war happened, and the place we were going to have it was sort of in the middle of the rocket zone. And I thought, you know, clearly, you can't breathe and meditate when there's rockets going off. And so we finally canceled it, OK? And there was a lot of unhappiness. And I was really not ha very happy with this Netta, whoever she was, who ignored me. And, and, and so Ingo thought, well, when we come to the Eurotas conference, let's the three of us meet. So that was the meeting. So I went with lots of grumpiness and met Netta, this wonderful woman with a big heart. And, you know, we started sharing things. And I believe, yes, her computer really did break. That, that was very true. But I started, you know, I, I, it is an emotional topic for me. So I started to tell her that I really had ambivalence. And I don't know that I ever want to come back. I was there 15 years ago. I went in a very idealistic way. There were three great religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. I was going to be there at Christmas time. They were all going to come together. When I was there, I, I felt the absolute opposite energy. I felt anger. I felt rage. I felt unhappiness. I was very sad. And I came home kind of depressed for months about it. 
It was an ideal of mine, and it didn't work. And I was telling this to Netta, and I was saying it in an emotional way. And she said, maybe a new time is coming. And that was in the past. And maybe there's another time. It would be different. And at that moment, my watch, which was on my wrist, broke off my wrist. It just broke the watch band. It didn't get caught on anything. There was, it's leather. It was the moment that she said, maybe this is about another time. And my watch fell off. And so I haven't had it on my wrist the whole, the whole conference. To sum it up, the time is up. To me, this is what psychotherapy after psychotherapy is. It's to be totally open and aware of the synchronicities, of the sacred ground that we're in, the signals we get, the spirit coming through. It's to pay attention because that broken, this broken watch gave me more information and more clarity and was, was as healing as anything could have been, because for me now, the message that I got, yes, this is a different time. You have to let go of the past, and you have to go forward, whatever that looks like. This is what I believe the transpersonal psychology needs to bring to its clients, ourselves, and the world around us. Because if we don't, there's going to be the fire in the water that, that Dimitri mentioned. So thank you. psychotherapy and wondering what to talk about, um, I started to think about the different realities in which those of you, including myself, work in and live in. Not so mysterious reality of ESM. <laughs> Now, something even less mysterious, realities of the health insurances that we work with, which promote medical over the psychological treatment and dictate us the type of therapy we are allowed to do, preferring brief, symptom-focused, called evidence-based therapy, and limiting us with the number of treatments we can do. And then another very important reality of where we are is the pharmaceutical companies that are growing and gaining more and more power. We are witnessing a huge increase in psychiatric diagnosis. I think at the moment I find that, I don't know, in the world, in South Africa, the bipolar 2 is one of the most favorite ones. Everybody is bipolar 2. And then ADHD, everybody is ADHD. So the use of multiple medication is another thing that I found in the practice. I almost have no one that I'm seeing in the practice that is on one drug at all. 
we talking three, four, five different medications at the same time. That's called healing. So, number of children or kids diagnosed with ADD have risen or increased in the last 10 years, 66%. It's very interesting. So now, what about ourselves being transpersonal therapists between other therapists? So the 1994 uh, research by the um, APA, the American Psychological Association, it was 1994, I don't think it changed much. That revealed that 85% of psychologists report rarely or never having discussed spiritual issues during their training. And I'm going to ask you something that we always laugh at. How does that make you feel? <laughs> this is how I feel being a transpersonal therapist between all the others. Yes, it's only one between many, but it's very colorful. <laughs> so, now one of the most important aspects of humanity and advancement is our ability to remain curious appreciate imagination and mysteries of life. So I just would like to go quickly through some of the mysteries that have puzzled and fascinated me since I've been born, probably many lives before, and certainly this one, and probably will remain for other lives. So the one most important, what is consciousness? <laughs> so, it says uh, there are two guys with uh, one just knocked out the wife, I would imagine, or the woman of his life, probably, and he said to the friend, I didn't have any choice, she was raising her consciousness. <laughs> So what is consciousness? And this is something that we still absolutely have no clue. It's still completely unsolved mystery. And we keep working with this consciousness, but we actually don't know what it is. Isn't it amazing? So where is it located? Is it in the brain? If so, where does it go when we die? How early does it enter our body? Is it when you're born? Is it when the egg is fertilized? Is it before? All these questions that I've been pondering all the time. So, uh, pioneer of the innovative scientific field called electrophotonics, uh, Dr. Konstantin Korotokov, who's based in Russia, he invented gas discharge visualization, or GDV technique. It's something similar to Kilian photography, if you heard about that, where they take the auras. Mm -hmm. Now, that particular technique is very it's innovative. already in use. In, uh, that's measuring electromagnetic fields. It's, in, it's a very advanced technology, and it's already in use in a predictive medicine. So it's looking at, the, for example, cancer prediction treatment. Now, this particular device was used to capture energy of dying person. And interesting things that he noted is that the, what he calls the soul of people who suffer a violent or unexpected death usually manifests in bioenergy returning to the body even days after the death. This is amazing. I was fascinated by this. And then he said that research found through these electromagnetic fields that the person's bioenergy field changes when someone else directs their attention to you, even when they completely consciously unaware that they've been observed. Something changes in your field by just you being observed without you knowing being observed. So the next one 
What are the emotions? Why do we have them? We work with them all the time. What are they? Why? Do plants and animals have emotions? Now, another interesting research from the same Professor Korokov, a Russian uh, physicist, uh, he performed an experiment measuring the bioenergetics of the plants. And what he found is that if the person, if the human being is approaching the plant with a loving energy, talking loving words, the bioenergy field, field expands and the colors change. If you're approaching the plant with negative energy or you want to cut it or hurt it, the energy starts getting retracted. So it's an amazing thing. So does that mean that the plant feels your energy? Now if you're into plants, like I am, I have a beautiful garden and a lot of birds, and I talk to my trees all the time. I have my favorite, I admit. And the funny thing is my favorite was growing faster than the one next to it, even though the landscaper said to me that the one next to it is a fast grain, this one is slow grain. And then he, when he came back to check my garden, he said, but how's this one going faster? I'm like, well, it's a special one. <laughs> this is my favorite. We're not allowed to, but anyway. So, another one. Um, this is what electromagnetic fields of emotions look like. It's very interesting. And the only one that has electromagnetic field everywhere, I think, is the love one. You can't see from there, but it's, it's very interesting. It's just showing all the different emotions and how it looks in the body. <coughs> and then the next one. What is the time? How is time represented in the brain? The very interesting thing is that when you do this, now the auditory system is actually processing a little bit faster, 30 milliseconds faster than your visual. So in fact, they're not happening at the same time, but our brain is employing fancy strategies and tricks to make it feel the same. Okay, But then that makes me question, uh, so is the time construction of our brain? Does it exist? Where is it? The next one. Why do we sleep and dream? One of the most astonishing aspects of our lives is that we spend third of our time sleeping. Newborn babies sleep twice as that. In humans, continuous wakefulness, and you know this in probably some of the, if you heard about the torture techniques, this is one of the torture techniques. If you keep people awake for a certain amount of days, they can go completely mad. The interesting thing is that the rats, deprived from sleep for 10 days, die. So all the mammals, reptiles, birds sleep, and voluntary breeders, such as dolphins, sleep with the brain, one brain hemisphere, dormant for a time. So that tells you that there is a universality of the sleep. Um, five minutes more? Okay. Zero. Oh, zero. Oh, is that? Oh, I thought you warned us. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to skip um, a lot of things and just give you... I want to share with you a few... <laughs> okay, we're not going to be... Sorry, I'll need to go through this. Take a few more minutes? Yes. 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 We would like to, to see that. Okay. Okay. So I'm just going to quickly go through. Sorry, it's a little bit difficult to you now. I don't know what my computer is doing now. Sorry. Now you. Okay, so just is there a free will? We're not going to be able to go through that. I want to do, where did we come from? Is it the God? Is it the evolution? Or is it from another planet? <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this. I just want to share with you. Okay, so this is important. So just for me, wanting to share with you what is, what is important to survive and to continue this job that I think is extremely difficult job, healing, healing ourselves and healing other people. Where from here? What do we need to remember? 
Quantum physicist and philosopher David Bohm was profoundly affected by his close contacts with both Einstein and J. Krishnamurti. Bohm's theory of wholeness and the intricate order states that there is something like life and mind unfolded in everything. The earth is one household, really. <laughs> We're not treating it that way, right? So that's the first step in economics, is to say the earth is one household and all that it depends on. It's all one, you see. So uh, now the implicate order would help us to see that, to see everything unfolds, everything. Everybody not really depends on everybody, but actually everybody is everybody in a deeper sense. See, we are the earth because all our substance comes from the earth and goes back. I mean, it, it's wrong to say it's an environment, you see, so just surrounding us because that would be like trying the brain regarding the stomach as part of its environment. <laughs> so the first thing we have to do for in the long run is to look at our whole way of thinking, which has developed over so many thousands of years. I don't think it was the original way of thinking of the human race at all, but for many c complex reasons it came about. Now, uh, that means that people have to make a uh, uh, they have to participate to make a cooperative effort to have a dialogue, a real dialogue in which we will <clears throat> not really exchange opinions, but actually listen deeply to the views of other people without resistance. And we cannot do this if we hold to our own opinion and resist the other. It doesn't mean we should accept the other, but we have to be able to look at all the opinions as suspended, as it were, in front of us without carrying them out, without suppressing them. And then just to end, what's important is to bring back the heart. <laughs> <laughs> to remember, to inspire, so there is no need to be perfect to inspire others. Let people get inspired by how you deal with your imperfections. And then all the inner child stuff that please we mustn't forget, the curiosity that we hold hopefully still in ourselves, the magic that we hold in ourselves, Also the dark sides of the reality, they are part of what we work with. <laughs> Our superpowers, which I do believe we have. <laughs> Our connection to everything. And our connection to everyone. And just a song that I want to read to you to conclude. It is called What If You Slept and it's from Samuel Coleridge and I believe that this song is very important to inspire us in our transpersonal journey. What if you slept and what if in your sleep you dreamed and what if in your dream you went to heaven and there you plucked a strange and beautiful flower. And what if, when you awoke, you had the flower in your hand? What then? Thank you. How much time do we have for the uh, questions? 20 minutes. I would like to say some words to all of you, please. Become an Eurodas member. It's easy. And you will have a more colorful life like, like Zana does. <laughs> Thank you to the four people who became members this morning. <laughs> Uh, questions for our panelists. But first, I, I was reminded of a story that I think is worth telling. I'm the uh, clinical director of one of the first, if not the first, spiritual emergence clinic. It's called the Kundalini Clinic, started by Lee Sonella, who wrote a book called Kundalini Transcendence or Psychosis. And the idea was, well, which is it? 
Is it a spiritual thing or is it a, 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 a psychiatric thing? You've got to differentially diagnose. But what I found over uh, being in this role of people coming to me with these unusual experiences, and when I would tell them, uh, well, let me just say, Kundalini is a very real thing. It's very specific and very rare. But people would come to me with all kinds of experiences, and I found when I told them, I think it might be related to Kundalini, they felt better. And uh, placebo, however, to explain, but at a more spiritual level, I thought, you know, Kundalini is mother. And mother wants uh, all the children to be okay, like the Jewish mother, the grandmother. And I felt, you know what, she's winking at me. Tell them they have Kundalini, it doesn't matter. They're going to feel better. They don't have to think they're nuts. That encouraged me. So I want to turn it back over to you all. And don't tell anybody I just said that. <laughs> Particularly my clients, because that would blow it. <laughs> but uh, please, addressing questions or comments. Yes. This is just to provoke you a little bit. I noticed that all of you have been humorous during your presentation. Does that mean humor is transpersonal? and or eventually therapeutic. Hello, I feel very much moved because uh, what happened to Judy and what happened to me, it was really a miracle from a home. And how I came in this seminar, one crazy lady in the middle of the still of the <laughs> street uh, exactly closed the holy river of Apollo here, that it is here, Delphina River, jumped in the middle of the street, say, say do you know where is the uh, pilot hotel? I said, yes, of course, I bring you there. That's what it was to me. So this area, and sorry, I came in again, but I want to see you all was a holy area. It was not uh, um, something uh, uh, strange that here in a foreign place that they were making the ritual, this conference that has to say in my language, in a foreign language, break duality, go to oneness, happens here. And it was here, the gods here in Greece and in Creta, were only present gods. You didn't need to go to make a, a psychotherapy or something else. The god was present all the time. The same god who threw Elizabeth in the middle of the street without to have any idea. The same god who break the uh, gods of Judith. And I have to tell you this also. Here there were rituals of incubation. Also, the owners of the hotel around here, also Mr. Papadakis is a hero. He was the best pilot in all over the uh, Hellas. And he was the only person who gave the honor to Greece to be protagonist, uh, Ch Ch champions in, in all uh, Europe in NATO exercises. So, there is holy energy exist here, and I am so much moved that we celebrate here oneness. This is what I feel. Thank you. And I'm also a, a counseling psychologist by training, and I specialize in treating complex post traumatic stress disorder. And so, one of the struggles that I have is this big loving we're having in transpersonal psychology that doesn't track with the world I work in of human trafficking and sexual bondage and molested children and murdered women. And so, it's funny, I, I didn't think I was going to get this um, activated. So, what is the point of transpersonal psychology in a world where children are being held in captivity and 
300 young African girls have been stolen and nobody's found them and nobody's done anything and we're talking and we're marching but they're still being raped and we all know that. I feel uh, what's actually coming up for me is anger, outrage, frustration that we're talking about light and joy and spirits and all of that and we're not talking about the really deep, dark, ugly aspect of our clinical work and I wonder can transpersonal psychology help that or is it utterly irrelevant? with Judith. Okay, now I come from South Africa and we work with PTSD all the time. It's one of the most violent countries, but I believe that where the most horrific things happen, that's where the best things happen. I have been twice um, held with a gun to my head and I'm not at all unusual. Every South African had at least one of those episodes. But for me, dealing with life and death is where even more becomes relevant. It was at those moments when I survived and I wasn't killed that I found the universe and God and realized something. And it was profound for me. And helping other people all the time with those horrific issues. I have worked for 10 years at the hospital that is disadvantaged and you don't ask have you been raped? You ask how many times have you been raped? But the most amazing thing, this is how I came to transpersonal. I didn't choose it, it chose me. Working in that hospital and working with people dying, people raped, that's where I realized that their spirit is what holds them together. When I spoke to them and I asked them, how did you survive those things? I had worked with the families of kids that are dying from the genetic disease. It's a horrible thing. Your child should never die before you. How do you deal with that? How do these kids deal with that? All of them taught me about the spirit. That's when I said to them, teach me. I don't know anything about Hinduism. I don't know anything about Muslim. There were different faiths. And they told me and I listened to them. And that's when I was initiated into transpersonal, they taught me the value. So I would say that's exactly what holds people together, that hope and connection to something above gives us the meaning to survive some of the most horrific things we all endure in the countries ourselves and so on. So to me that's very valuable. We can't go down. Thank you. I, I'm Ashok, and I was I found very moving your different narratives and reflections along uh, what what is the heart of psych transpersonal at this point. And after the last question, I wondered how I could even ask what I'm going to ask or say what I think some of you helped by. And I heard this in Judith as well, and and in, in your own all your voices that whatever else your trail that brought you, whatever lenses you went through, there's something about being in the moment. And I think in the bone, to really open your lens and show up and be there is the portal into the presence. And that is a source of healing that is the heart of the transfer. I just wondered if you have any comments about that. I heard, I heard a resonance in all your diversity. I heard an echo of the importance of the art of human art of dialogue, of being open in that moment as a healing moment. Yes, I agree. And, you know, it is said that when you're in the moment, that's the only place to find God. So if, if we're going to be aware and conscious of the sacred, then we have to be in the moment because the past is over and we don't know what the future is. And that's living fully. So I agree. Oh. Um, 
in Russia, uh, we have special type of uh, PTSD. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have post perestroika traumatic syndrome, where the whole country after perestroika open to uh, the rest of the world. And uh, I remember it, it was tremendous and very challenging uh, change uh, in uh, my country. But what? Uh, was respond to uh, different types of psychotherapy. Before perestroika, we had only one type of psychotherapy, mostly be behavioral psychotherapy, Ivan Petrovich Pavlov. Yeah. But after perestroika, when Stengroff, uh, 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 Carl Rogers, uh, Virginia Satir, everybody uh, came to Russia presenting new types, uh, Western type uh, of psychotherapy, Kirchstein, Prozis, Walk, etc., etc. In 2001, we had a um, European conference on psychotherapy in Russia with uh, thousands of participants. And it happens that uh, uh, we had uh, 40 uh, uh, different uh, panels for different types of psychotherapy. And it happens that for transpersonal psychotherapy came half of the conference. 500 people came to one uh, to do transpersonal psychotherapy. Uh, and uh, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the possible reply what uh, transpersonal psychotherapy can do uh, to help people, to provide openness, first of all. We, we are human beings, and so we connect from our own integrity, but we can be open, we can be sensitive, we can, uh, we, we can uh, go through any boundaries, we can be really transpersonal, being very connected and very practical at the same time, very human and loving. Jakubowicz, and, um, and I feel very touched by what, what has been said, and especially the, the topic about uh, how do we treat people in the world we are in now. Uh, and I really resonate with the, what, what you said about how we can, you know, live in a, with this challenge when so many people are. Uh, are dying or there is so much energy turned against life on this earth. Uh, I'm a psychotherapist, a transpersonal psychotherapist and, and a wounded healer. I feel I recovered from real deep wounds after right after the war being Jewish and having parents going through Holocaust. And that was really dark and really hungry and really really, really nervous and sad and there was no God uh, because uh, the parents didn't believe in God. So I, I was looking for something spiritual, even didn't knowing, not knowing what it is, escaping to the church. And what helped me to recover from this trauma was meeting the people with the you know, spiritual people with a big hearts who are reflecting my heart, who are showing me that deep inside me there is a very wise, compassionate, loving, uh, ageless, boundless being who can embrace, love, accept, and transform all the dark wounded experiences in me. So I've, I've learned that, that this transpersonal self in me, in my heart, can really bring back all the, the zone split off, uh, scattered pieces of me, of my soul, and put it all together in one piece, from many pieces to one piece of my soul. And that's what saved me and since, since that, I'm with people, you know, from different paths of life who suffer a lot with this transpersonal heart which can embrace and transform what's wounded and dark. Thank you. About three or four minutes.
hello. Uh, my name is Mark Quinn, and this is my first Eurotax conference. And I'd just like to actually respond to something that you said. Um, I'm also involved in the psychodrama movement, and I'm part of the Trauma and Disaster Task Force team. And I'm actually wondering whether it would be an idea to actually create something similar within the transpersonal, so we can actually do something out in the world. And I would be very happy to, even though I'm just a member, but certainly to talk to someone to tell you about our experiences and what we do, and how we react to that. In 2011, um, there was, we have an international list serve, which is where everyone is connected, and we had a, an NGO who wrote from Bangladesh to say that they had a, a trauma in one of the small villages and they were doing social theatre and within four weeks we raised funds and we went out and worked with the children and the teachers and the adults who were actually suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. It's just one possible suggestion. Thank you. beautiful. Uh, many of us here are psychotherapists. That means wounded children. That means we decided to follow other wounded children to the path of sorrow, to the path of shadow. That's something that's difficult for us self, ourselves. But it is a way. It is a way to give hope to this earth that we live uh, in a time that it is an end time, because something new is coming. And we are here in this nice hotel, but outside on the island in Greece, in the world, are many, many people that need psychotherapy, that need support, and they have no possibility to pay for that. They can take new tranquilizers, and we are going to have a new generation of addicts and much more money for the industry of pharmacy. Uh, I think we have, and it's an obligation of all of us, to work uh, voluntarily, not only for our, our pocket. Uh, I do that, and I will say this world needs that. And perhaps the next time it is better not to have such a luxurious hotel so that some college of us that could not be able to come because they, they were not able to pay. It is a big discrepancy between our, the pictures in our mind and the reality very often. Because very often we are very romantic, like small children. We want to have another world. But this world outside is very hard, and it really that every one of us, every one of us, uh, have, has the feeling that uh, has to overcome uh, his small ego and uh, try to be one with all these people outside that they are lost because they they know nothing about all these nice things we speak here. They know nothing about. They live in the darkness. And we can be just small sunshine for them, very small sunshine. And we, we have to, to be strong to keep our light, because it is very easy to lose our light in this darkness. It was a very wonderful experience for me to be here. I came here with borrowed get money. I didn't have the money to stay in this hotel. I have to, to drive away to come every day. So please think the other time that the psychologist college in this world, they are not rich anymore. And that's right, because we are near to our clients. Thank you.
They're boring. <laughs> this was really very, very uh, interesting in all very uh, different ways. Lindy has, yeah. And Lindy has some uh, announcements for all of us. Thank you. So, good morning, everybody. I found that was a really inspiring morning. Excellent, great, I'm feeling good. This conference is flowing in the way that it is, but we do need to make some announcements. Uh, Eleni, if you could just stand up at the back there. All the keynote speakers and your ROTAS board, please meet with Eleni outside on your way out. She will be at the registration table. Changes to the program today between 2 and 4, Giovanna Calabrese and Claudia Calcina. Their workshop will not take place in Yarino, but it will take place in Kidonia. Not in Yarino, but Kidonia. There will be an exhibition here tonight from 18.30 here in Athena. There will be icons an exhibition of icons from the icon, Lapis Icons. We will have Apollonian CDs with the Apollonian music, some of Martin Garcia and Fredette's books, and some CDs of Ladislav Matronitsky, The Soul of Europe. John Drew's wonderful Soul of Europe will begin here at 8 o'clock not as it is on the program, and it will last until 9.30, when we will all move towards the bar that is near the sea to have wine, snacks, and dance the night away. And tomorrow we have a beautiful and full closure of the conference, so please join us for this conference and this closure, because it is very important, I think, for everybody to be part of that closure. So even if you have some people that are not here, do encourage them all to come tomorrow because we have a wonderful and full winding down before some of us move on to Pestos. Have a wonderful afternoon.